Welcome to another evening lecture with Francis Tavern Museum. Uh, remember, if you have any questions during the lecture, please leave them in the chat or the Q&A box. We will be monitoring the Q&A during the lecture, so don't worry about saving your question until the end. Get it in there once you have it so you don't forget. And we will try to get to as many questions as we are able to in our allotted time. Now, as always, the views of the speaker are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of Sons of the Revolution in the state of New York Incorporated or its Francis Tavern Museum. And let me introduce tonight's speaker. David Gelman is a professor of history at DePaul University, where he has taught since 1999. In addition to Liberty's Chain, the subject of tonight's lecture, his books include Emancipating New York, Jim Crow New York, and American Odysseys. I'm now going to turn it over to you, David. Okay, I've unmuted myself successfully. Yes, good. All right. Well, um, good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you, Sarah, for arranging this event and for your warm introduction. Uh, and most of all, thank you to the audience for being here on this summer night when you have so many other non-historical options. So, uh, why is my... Or why my image is not advancing. Um, my images are frozen. So um, try clicking on your screen and then seeing if you could advance. Okay. okay, good. All right, good. All right, we're good. Sorry about that. All right. Um, so who was John Jay? Uh, John Jay was without a doubt one of the seven most influential of the revered founding fathers, um, and he is the least studied and most underappreciated. Note, uh, there's only five others on the screen. I put the five uh, other slaveholding founding fathers of the seven most revered founding fathers, leaving John Adams off. So George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Benjamin Franklin, and John Jay, uh, all uh, slave owners. Um, all incredibly important uh, founding fathers. So um, as a diplomat, Continental Congress officer, state constitution writer, federal constitution advocate, and two-term New York state governor, Jay's influence was deep and broad. Uh, but the hat of fame tends to hang on the hook of first. And John Jay, um, therefore, is often known as the first chief justice of the United States, appointed to the Supreme Court by George Washington and here, John Jay is pictured in his uh, judicial robes. Um, as the title of my talk and my book suggests, mine is a family study, a multi-generational family study. The book centers on the consequential century that runs from the early years of the Revolutionary War through the end of Reconstruction, roughly 1777 to 1877. But the story really goes all the way back to 1685 when John Jay's grandfather, Auguste, a Protestant felt compelled to leave France. And it extends to the early years of the 20th century when on August 18th, 1912, almost exactly 220 years ago uh, today, John Jay's great-great-grandson, John Jay Chapman, delivered an impassioned reflection on racial reckoning in the wake of a horrific lynching in Southeastern Pennsylvania. So there's a long arc to this uh, story that goes from the age of sail to the age of the automobile in order to ponder the legacy of the American Revolution for enslaved and free inhabitants of this country. And the goal is to consider how an important American family transmitted and transformed its values when confronting issues of slavery and racism across the generations. But rather than try to deliver the entire arc of the narrative of my book and encompass all of its black and white characters, I decided to use the US Supreme Court as a scaffolding for my remarks tonight. The court has been very much on my mind of late, though I don't intend to share or inflict on you my particular opinions on the recent term, except to say that history came up a lot in the current justices' opinions, and nothing matters more to me than American history. But long before the current moment, I conceived of my J project as one that, in engaging a wide sweep of US history, reflects on key words, challenging words that shape our discourse and our national politics to this day. And those words are conservatism, radicalism, and patriotism. 
it's worth noting, although I won't, I, I might save this for the Q&A, it's worth noting that in many ways the Jays uh, embodied a sort of conservative uh, political and social and cultural tradition in American history. These were not natural radicals. Um, they are a landholding family going way back into the, um, into the early 18th century. Um, they, they're in their religious views and their views on gender and their views on property holding and their views on democracy. In many ways, uh, this is a very conservative family. Um, and yet, members of this family, especially John Jay's son's son, William, and his grandson, John Jay II, pictured here, embraced causes, abolitionism, and racial equality that define them as radicals, and even as, to quote some of their critics, fanatics in the eyes of their contemporaries. Indeed, by becoming radical abolitionists, these later Jays embraced the cause most likely to rip the nation apart, that nation whose founding is the source of the, the family's prestige and historical reputation. And so that's, that's one of the ironies that I'm exploring in this book, that this is a conservative family deeply identified with the founding and, and, and a founding father um, that embraces a cause, just to say it again, that is most likely to destroy the nation upon whom their, their family name derives its great fame. So um, as a result of this tension, a lot of thought and a lot of personal identity in the Jay family, particularly later on, was invested in interrogating what constituted patriotism? What is patriotism? What obligations does a person have to the nation when it, it, the nation's course opposes um, one's ideas of morality um, and of, of, of the divine? John Jay II in particular looked for ways to reunite the family's identity with that of the nation as sectional crisis slid into the Civil War. But I'm here to tell you for most of the, uh, the, the middle of the 19th century, identifying um, the family's cause of anti-slavery and abolitionism with the cause of the nation became harder and harder and harder. Um, in other words, that sort of family, there's sort of two centers of gravity. There's a reputation as a founding family and there's this cause of slavery and these things are pulling in diametrically opposed directions and bringing them back together um, is no easy feat. Uh, but I digress a little because I promised you I was going to focus uh, and use the Supreme Court um, as an organizing uh, principle for um, selecting my particular remarks this evening. Um, so John Jay's years as Chief Justice were 1789 to 1795, and they offer a microcosm of the ways in which questions of, back, of black slavery and black freedom remain an unresolved but unavoidable subject for this founding father and for the founding fathers in general, as the nation began to chart its course in the wake of the Constitution's ratification. On embarking on his new post as Chief Justice, John Jay resigned a post that had made him another remarkable first. Since 1785, he had served as the inaugural president of the New York Manumission Society, one of the world's first anti-slavery organizations. And I want to I want to state that again. So John Jay was the inaugural president, founding president of the New York Manumission Society, which again is one of the first organized anti-slave, not the first, but one of the not the very first, but one of the first um, anti-slavery organizations in the entire Western world. And he resigned from this post to take um, on the job of Chief Justice. So it's worth going back a little bit and saying, so what is this New York Manumission Society? What did it do? Why was it founded? So it was largely founded by New York Quakers who um, were ahead of, well ahead of the rest of society in identifying slavery as a moral evil and, um, and sort of demanding and sort of compelling their fellow Quakers to withdraw um, as slaveholders and slave traders themselves. Um, but you know, Quaker anti-slavery um, would only go so far. And so the Quaker activists in New York and in, in Pennsylvania and other places, which uh, gave rise to an early anti-slavery organization, knew they had to partner with non-Quakers, with prestigious uh, people, with prestigious men um, who would carry that cause that had transform or eliminate Quaker slaveholding. Um, they realized they had to partner with people who could help carry those principles into the new nation. And so um, they recruited people like John Jay and Alexander Hamilton and other prominent merchants and, and, uh, and lawyers uh, to be part of this organization. Um, and this organization was dedicated to a number of things. Um, 
one, they tried to enforce the existing laws um, or, and advocate for new laws to limit um, slavery, in this case in New York. So uh, laws passed to make it illegal to import new enslaved people into the state. And then later, uh, the state legislature passed a law um, to prevent the export of slaves out of the state. So enforcing these laws becomes a major mission of the Manumission Society. Um, and they hire lawyers um, to not hire, but lawyers volunteer uh, to enforce these laws uh, and also to enforce laws that define slavery. Because, um, for example, if um, you could prove that you were a descendant of a mother who was not African-American and not enslaved, you could get your freedom. And so uh, there are cases the Manumission Society pursued where someone was able to establish that, uh, you know, that their mother or their grandmother was a Native American and therefore their slavery um, was illegal. And there are all sorts of other laws regulating slavery that the Manumission Society tried to enforce. They also advocate through petitions and lobbying with the state legislature to pass these laws. And ultimately, um, they want the leg state legislature to um, pass a gradual abolition law, um, and I'll describe that uh, later in the talk, but the idea is to pass a law that will wind down the institution of slavery. So they're major advocates for that. Um, they also take up um, the uh, project of education. And so uh, one of the lasting legacies of New York Manumission Society is the African Free School, which then later evolves into a series of schools in which uh, young uh, African American boys and girls enslaved and free uh, are receiving a quality education. Um, many of the people who attend the African Free School have become leading leaders of the black community in the 19th century and leading abolitionists as well. So there's an educational mission. There's also an outreach mission to uh, abolitionists in other states and indeed in other countries such as Britain and France. And John Jay, um, this prominent American diplomat politician um, is selected as the inaugural president of this um, pathbreaking um, abolition society. Um, so, as I said, when John Jay takes um, his place on the Supreme Court, um, he resigns his presidency. Um, however, John Jay does not resign something else, which is his status as a slaveholder. One of the things that confuses people or troubles people uh, about the New York Manumission Society is they allowed, and in fact, many of their members um, own slaves, including John Jay, and 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 any uh, and the attempt to, to find a way to banish slaveholders from the organization always failed because they wanted these people, these prestigious people who said, and we'll get into this, um, that they were against slavery, but were not ready to give up on their uh, quite yet on owning slaves themselves. And this is a paradox that we we can talk about. Um, and it's worth noting. So if John Jay resigned his position as uh, president of the Manumission Society, the Abolition Society, because maybe there would be a conflict of interest, because maybe he thought a case might arise before the Supreme Court relating to slavery, um, he didn't apply that same principle to um, slave owning itself, where presumably that would also be, also be a conflict of interest. So that's worth noting. Um, and it's worth noting that um, in the 1790 census, uh, John Jay is listed as owner, the owner of five uh, enslaved people. Um, and this may seem shocking, um, but it's worth noting that Jays are a prominent family married into all the prominent New York families um, and all of the prominent New York uh, merchant and land owning families. Um, and then many ordinary New Yorkers as well, enslaved people own slaves, that slavery was um, legal and practice in every single one of the North and South, every single English colony on the mainland, not to mention the Caribbean, um, during throughout the colonial period. Uh, and the Jays as a prominent um, merchant family married into even more prominent uh, merchant families, um, owned slaves throughout the 18th century. And indeed, uh, John Jay's grandfather, Auguste, and his um, father, Peter, along with some of uh, Peter's brothers-in-laws, did participate uh, in bringing enslaved people from the West Indies into New York. That's documented. You know, you can see the voyages. You can see people listed. I've not been able to find them listed on transatlantic um, slave trading, but uh, that doesn't mean that they weren't. I just haven't been able to find that in the vast database of the transatlantic slave trading. But they definitely not only own people, but they also imported people um, and sold them into the uh, state of New York in this colony 
Um, that was worth noting, the colony north of Maryland and then the state north of Maryland with the largest percentage and most enslaved people. And New York at various times, you know, verged on becoming, never became a full-blown slave society, but it verged on that uh, in the middle of the 18th century. Uh, and, you know, at the top percentage of enslaved people in Manhattan in mid-century, 18th century was about, you know, one in five, 20%. Um, slavery is widely practiced uh, on Long Island and in the Hudson Valley. Um, and, you know, wealthy families own more enslaved people. Uh, you know, many uh, Dutch families might own one or two people, but slavery is prevalent practice from the New Amsterdam period all the way through the English period. Um, and it's worth noting um, that in one of the most famous episodes in the history of uh, slavery in New York, the um, so-called uh, Great Negro Plot of 1741, um, there are two uh, people owned by the Jays who are all over the testimony uh, and are identified as potentially plotters to burn the city of New York down. And um, and you can find them on this is a list of uh, uh, enslaved people who were committed uh, and you can find a Jay family slave here. Uh, there we go. Uh, Brash, uh, who was not executed, but is sent off to Madeira uh, for his alleged role in the alleged conspiracy. So um, the Jay's history of slaveholding is intimately tied to, um, uh, to the history of slavery in New York. These are not like separate uh, stories. So John Jay is, is following in the tradition of New York elites and his own family in owning slaves. And again, here's the 1790 census record where you see the arrow showing John Jay. And if you kind of slide over, um, that you can see that, um, you know, that there are five uh, enslaved people listed um, on their account. Okay. Um, so, um, John Jay, nonetheless, as I mentioned, is um, also one who's articulated his opposition to slavery during this period. Uh, in a draft of a letter he wrote that he didn't, uh, he crossed this passage out, but he wrote it, um, and you can find it in the record, to uh, the Quaker John Murray Jr., who's the longtime treasurer of the Manumission Society, he writes, what acts of public or private justice and philanthropy can occasion more pleasing emotions than such as tend to restore to the oppressed their natural rights? And he acknowledged that slaveholders were, quote, not created more free, more rational, more immortal than those they enslaved. Um, so, I mean, John Jay has expressed himself clearly um, as seeing in, in other places, both in it, as being a member of the Manumission Society and in some of his private reflections, um, that he sees slavery as violating natural rights and he doesn't believe that um, enslavers, that white people are inherently created more free, more rational, or more immortal than black people. So you have this contradiction that runs through much of Jay's public career, that um, he has anti-slavery ideas, but his actions, both public and private, um, uh, don't always line up so well. Um, and it's worth noting when he became Chief Justice, um, this only enhanced John Jay's perceived need to enslave other people. Indeed, he acquired a man named Pete to attend to his personal needs as he rode circuit as a federal trial judge, an onerous duty that Supreme Court justice is no longer perform, and they hated this duty. They hated all the travel. People don't realize that the Supreme Court didn't uh, really sort of have this sort of uh, August building in Washington, D.C. until uh, well into the 20th century and that, uh, and that they rode circuit you know, through most of the 19th century. I forget exactly when they finally got rid of that duty. And John Jay felt like he needed this guy, Pete, as a sort of personal attendant um, while he uh, traveled uh, across the bumpy and muddy roads, uh, highways and byways um, as, a, as a, a circuit trial judge, federal judge, as well as being chief justice. Meanwhile, his wife, Sarah Livingston Jay, pictured here with two of her children, um, had relied on men such as Yaff, Maria, Essex, Benny, and Clorinda to help maintain a household that as of 1792 included um, five of John and Sarah Jay's children, two of whom are pictured here. So right there is a stark contradiction. Again, John Jay, the recently resigned lead officer in an anti-slavery organization was still in the business of owning and acquiring enslaved people. Um, he was aware, again, of slavery's philosophically problematic status, as well as the personal hardships imposed on enslaved people. In a letter to his son, Peter Augustus Jay in 1791, Jay remarked, John Jay remarked, 
providence has placed these persons in the stations below us. They are servants, but they are men. And then he condescendingly added, kindness to inferiors more strongly indicates magnanimity than meanness. So um, he also has this sort of noblesse oblige notion that, you know, though slavery is abs in the abstract a wrong, while we enslave people, while we have connections to them, um, you know, he, he says we should treat people magnanimously. Well, um, there's this tradition in the Jay family of, um, of elderly former family slaves, if they're deemed to have been uh, loyal uh, to sort of provide um, some funds for their maintenance in their old age. So he's, he's also sort of socializing his son, Peter Augustus Jay, into this notion um, that something sort of is owed um, by those who are socially, although not naturally, superior um, to those who are socially, you know, um, but not naturally inferior. So again, filled with contradictions. So while a slavery case never um, came before him as chief justice, he did refer to slavery in one consequential 1793 case about the jurisdiction of the federal judiciary known as Chisholm v. Georgia. So I'm not gonna go into that. The details of the case don't matter, but I want you to hear what Jay said as chief justice when he thought about slavery philosophically in this case. Jay wished to make a distinction between quote, feudal ideas and quote, equal justice that applied to sovereign citizens in the US. As an aside acknowledged, African slaves among us, end quote, might occupy a position akin to subjects. In other words, slavery was a feudal outcropping and an acknowledged anomaly in a system of justice predicated on equality. So again, when he's sort of trying to make distinctions between what a free society is like and what a Republican society is like uh, versus a feudal society, he goes to slavery as an as a indication of the difference. And in a sense, then he's saying his own household embodied feudal, not um, Republican principles. Um, Jay articulated his thinking about this anomaly further uh, and what could be done about when he ran for governor. I'm just going to put up a map of New York here um, uh, so you can see uh, some of the key locations. So as I said, John Jay did not like riding circuit. The Supreme Court didn't maybe have the full prestige that definitely didn't have the full prestige that it does now. And so uh, he's persuaded to run for governor while he's um, still uh, chief justice. And it's interesting to note that in that campaign, his status as a slaveholder did not protect him from the suspicion that if elected, he would attempt to deprive his fellow New Yorkers of their enslaved property. In other words, John Jay was politically vulnerable because he had been associated with the New York Manumission Society. He had, he, you know, he is, was on the record as some kind of abolitionist um, and his opponents tried to make hay out of that, that if you elect this guy, John Jay, in essence, he's going to take your enslaved um, property away. Um, and when this concern was brought to John Jay's attention by, by one of his surrogates, one of his supporters, uh, he declined to disavow his anti-slavery principles. Uh, indeed, Jay wrote a letter, and by the way, in this day and age, when people wrote letters, particularly on political subjects, there's sort of assumption that either the letter or the sentiments are going to be shared. Right? He's not trying to keep this a secret. Um, Jay, in a letter to this um, supporter who was warning him about how his association with the Manumission Society might drag him down politically, um, praised the Manumission Society's commitment to um, New York's Black population, protecting them from, quote, man, quote, man stealers who sought to spirit them out of the state. And he also embraced the education mission because he said Black children will become useful members of society. And so he supported the mission of his former organization. And he further wrote, in my opinion, every man of color and description has a natural right to freedom. So you're seeing a pattern here. John Jay again and again refers to natural rights to freedom. That, it's, that, that nature does not want people to be enslaved. Society tolerates slavery. In fact, he not only tolerates slavery, he practices slavery but, it's, but it, it violates some sort of natural right and that his organization, his former organization was committed to seeing that that natural right um, became you know, law and custom. Uh, so he viewed the gradual mansion, but he viewed this as you know, something that happens gradually and, and saw that as a realistic path forward. Um, he did not favor uh, like most of his white contemporaries, uh, any sort of government mandated immediate emancipation. Um, and anyway, to make a long story short, he paid a price in this in the election for his um, 
anti-slavery views. He it was a razor thin margin of defeat. Several of the counties with the largest concentration of enslaved people went to his opponent, incumbent Governor George Clinton, uh, while Jay performed better in counties with smaller proportions of the enslaved and in New York City, where presumably the Manumission Society's actual work was better understood. So he loses this election. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating election and full of controversies and questions about the proper casting of ballots in one county, and it seems in some weird ways very familiar to us. So um, here lies or uh, underscores uh, a revealing surprise. We in, in 2022 rightly view Chief Justice Jay's position on slavery as somewhat self-serving and certainly uh, uh, hypocritical and, and, and timid. But Jay did pay a political price for these seemingly timid views because other people thought any advocacy of emancipation in New York was too much of uh, advocacy. The contradiction of Chief Justice John Jay's stance on slavery during these years became more apparent, not in the bench, but in his uh, diplomatic roles, uh, in a move that is unfathomable now. I mean, you just cannot imagine this. And it was controversial even then. President Washington tapped the sitting Chief Justice to travel to Britain to negotiate a treaty to stave off a potentially devastating war with the former mother country. Uh, people at the time uh, had some raised eyebrows about the idea of sending a sitting Chief Justice to do uh, executive diplomatic work, but he was uh, one of the nation's most skilled and knowledgeable diplomats. He helped to negotiate the Peace of Paris in 1783. He was um, essentially in charge of our foreign affairs during um, the Confederation period. Um, so skilled diplomat. So Hamilton and uh, his Secretary of Treasury and, and um, Washington tapped Jay to go to England, uh, where he boarded a ship with a small party that included his son, Peter Augustus, and the enslaved man, Pete, that he had purchased to assist him while he was Chief Justice. Uh, and this is a really problematic thing that he did for all kinds of reasons. Not only is Pete now being separated from his family and the world he knows, but due to a very famous decision that John Jay definitely as a lawyer knew about, the 1772 Somerset decision had essentially ruled that England was free soil, that, um, that you could not, and a person who owned slaves legally in the Americas could not bring an enslaved person onto English soil and, and expect um, to retain the rights to, uh, to that person and to, to bring them back. Uh, very famous decision, the Mansfield Somerset decision of 1772. And here is John Jay bringing his personal slave uh, to the land of the Somerset decision. I can only presume that Jay calculated that Pete, who left a wife back in America, would not contest his bondage while overseas and by you know, running away or seeking the help of abolitionists. Um, indeed, we have evidence that Pete longed for home, feeling, an exacer he, feeling exacerbated by the scorn and torments of English servants that Jay's hired. Uh, and these servants were very cruel to him, um, played pranks on him. And, and he was, Pete was, by all accounts, by John Jay's accounts, very unhappy in England. Um, so he, again, another paradox, another, uh, another um, contradiction, because at the level of policy and principle, in some ways, Jay's mission to England fortified his anti-slavery principles. One of the issues that was agitating relations with Britain was the fact that after the war for independence, as it wound down, thousands of formerly enslaved African-Americans departed as free people with the British to Nova Scotia um, and other places. Um, and this, many Americans claim, was a violation of the terms of the peace treaty with Britain that Jay himself had written uh, in Paris. So. Um, so Jay is in part dispatched to um, you know, get compensation. It's not the major issue. It is a, it's not the major issue, but it's an issue that's on the agenda of things that the United States is supposed to seek from the British. Um, but he, Jay utterly failed to get the British to move on any sort of financial compensation um, for these uh, enslaved people or formerly enslaved people who departed uh, at the end of the Revolutionary War. But what's interesting is that um, Jay informed the Secretary of State, Virginia Edmund Randolph, that he thought the British position was not, with, not only could he not move the British, but he said, I think they're right. And the American demand is wrong. Um, so he basically sent you know, his diplomatic boss saying like, I think the British are right to refuse to compensate us for slaves and we're wrong to ask, which is 
pretty significant movement on Jay's part since he's the one who negotiated the treaty in 1783. Um, he, Jay conceded that at the end of the war, the Revolutionary War, the British had rightly protected the natural rights of the enslaved people who accepted the offer of freedom and protection behind British lines. Randolph was not happy with Jay and kind of in letters browbeat him about this, but it was too late to make a difference. John Jay had already made that concession. Uh, and the Jay Treaty, which is forever known, this treaty is the Jay Treaty, makes no mention of compensation for black people who had long ago evacuated to their freedom. Meanwhile, during his extended stay in England, Jay befriended great part, the great parliamentary lion of abolitionism, William Wilberforce, uh, and met some other abolitionists. So I think that while he was in England, despite this contradiction that he's bringing his enslaved person, he's hanging out with a British abolitionists. He's making a concession that the British are on the right side um, of, of the moral issue of whether uh, you can demand compensation for enslaved uh, people. Um, so this is to me a really interesting kind of moment. Uh, when he returns to the US in uh, spring 1795, his service as chief justice um, essentially ends because while he was overseas, um, his colleagues get him, sorry, I just want to keep track of the time here. Um, his uh, colleagues get him elected to uh, governor of New York. So he's now freed of this burden of being chief justice. And, uh, uh, George Clinton had temporarily retired, didn't want to be governor anymore, and John Jay won. Um, and it turns out, and I, I don't want to go uh, into this too much today, it turns out that his time as governor was incredibly consequential. Um, because in 1799, uh, during Governor Jay's second term, the state finally passed a gradual abolition law. Now, this letter here, I don't expect you to be able to read. It's hard, uh, hard for me to read, and I read old uh, dead people's handwriting all the time. But this is a letter in 1795 from a young 20-something-year-old uh, free African-American tradesman named William Hamilton, who writes the new governor and basically says, you've got to do something about slavery. Um, that, that it is morally right, it's time, uh, that slavery constitutes essentially uh, stealing, robbing people of their lives. Uh, he includes some English anti-slavery poetry in the letter. Um, there's no, um, I have no evidence that John Day responded to this letter, but I wanted to insert it into my talk to show that, look, um, these are things that are going on. That there's a, there's a beginnings of a free black community that is starting to advocate for the freedom of the rest of uh, their fellow New Yorkers uh, and making the same kinds of arguments that John Jay has been making kind of in private about the wrongs of slavery uh, for some time, sometimes in public for some time. And, it, and again, it comes to pass uh, that New York passes a law um, for gradual emancipation. Uh, now, so I wrote a book uh, years ago on the abolition of uh, slavery in New York. So this could be this significant rabbit hole that we could go down. So I'll try to be brief. So let me just say what gradual emancipation is as a concept and then why it passed uh, in New York and became law before we move on, which is so that the working model of gradual emancipation in Connecticut, Rhode Island, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, and New Jersey. And Pennsylvania gets out of the gate first in 1780, uh, Rhode Island and Connecticut in 1784, New York not till 1799, and New Jersey not till 1804. And the standard model is you pick a date and you say, all people born to enslaved mothers after this date will be born free, but required to serve their mother's masters until an age that will set, you know, could be 18, could be 21, could be 25, could be 28. So that's the sort of reigning um, legislative formula in the North for emancipating um, people. It's a very slow, gradual process uh, that in a time when people live much shorter lives, um, sort of essentially indentured the children of enslaved mothers well into adulthood. And that is the formula that New York adopts in 1799. Um, interestingly and revealingly, New York picks July 4th, 1799 as the last day um, after which, if you're born after that date, you're born free. Um, so the symbolism, even though it in some ways underscores the paradox, the hypocrisy, the symbolism there is that we are somehow carrying on the traditions of the revolution by picking this date as July 4th as the sort of cutoff date after which you are born a free person in New York. But if you're a man, you have to serve until uh, 28. And if you're a woman, you serve till 25. So it's a very slow process, but it is ultimately a decisive one. New York doesn't go back on this in the largest slave state north of Maryland, finally initiates um, a program of gradual emancipation. 
Uh, it took a long time. I mean, the, the legislation was it was introduced originally back in the 1780s, started to re, be reintroduced in, in the mid 1790s, around the time Jay became governor. Uh, took a long time, um, but they got it done. Uh, part of the reason uh, is that New Yorkers increasingly had sort of defined themselves as Northerners, as very distinct, uh, in a very distinct region from uh, from the South, uh, who imagined their economic dynamism. Um, not relying on this sort of retrograde institution of, of slavery. Um, also, as more and more counties, this is a, a later map, so it has too many counties, uh, but as more and more Western counties with virtually no enslaved people uh, become part of the legislature, the ways in which um, the, uh, the regions that had more enslaved people were, uh, they tried to get the state to financially compensate them uh, for these measures. Um, have no, no, the Western delegates have no interest um, in um, spending money to essentially um, subsidize slavery uh, in regions where slavery is still widely practiced. And so for a variety of reasons, um, they get it over the top. And uh, so New York, even in this hyper-partisan era, and it was viciously partisan the 1790s in New York and everywhere else, they get this gradual emancipation law passed. Now it's worth noting that John Jay uh, retires from public life in 1801, uh, after two terms as New York governor, but he doesn't die until 1829. And this is the house. Uh, it's a wonderful site. I hope you all visit it up in, uh, in Petona, um, the, the Jay Homestead. Um, and during that time, he largely resisted attempts to draw him into any public controversy, let alone public controversies on slavery. Um, but as I mentioned, future generations of Jays are very interested in this issue of slavery. Um, and so the, the, the issue still matters um, in the family. And it's also worth noting that there are still enslaved people in the Jay household. Um, the last two being a mother-daughter uh, combination, Clorinda and her daughter Zilpa, um, who, are, who, who live and work in the homestead. Uh, Zilpa is temporarily banished from the homestead. She gets pregnant uh, as a teenager. And so she's sort of fobbed off on a, a Livingston uh, relative. Um, and Clorinda begs John Jay to let Zilpa return when Zilpa's um, uh, toddler dies. So this is an incredibly tragic story, but incredibly courageous of Clorinda to say to uh, the, the person who owns her and who has all the power to sort of press her case to bring her daughter back home, um, uh, wins the day. And then John Jay uh, applies his own um, gradual emancipation formula to uh, uh, Zilpa and declares, well, she's about in 1817, at the very moment that New York passes an accelerated emancipation law that says all enslaved people will now be free by 1827 in New York. At that very moment, John Jay says, you know, I think Zilpa's about to turn 25. I'm going to grant her her freedom. Uh, and then we don't know how Clorinda gets her freedom, but in the 1820 census, she's a member of the household, but no longer listed as an enslaved person. So there's this transition to indentured servitude and wage work within the household. Um, John Jay's son, Peter Augustus, meanwhile, has followed in his father's footsteps as a president of the New York Manumission Society and, a, and an advocate um, for uh, uh, African-Americans in New York uh, and nationally. Uh, and he kind of pulls John Jay into kind of his last major public political act, which is um, to release a letter, which you can see on your right, saying that basically those in the North who want to not allow Missouri into the um, into, this, into the nation as a state unless, uh, as a slave state, they want to reject Missouri as long as Missouri has a, wants to have slavery. Um, John Jay releases a letter that says that, that, that he supports the opposition to extending slavery to this future state of Missouri. Um, and John Jay you know, has a lot of prestige and have to do this. He's again, he's the former chief justice of the United States. Um, he offers some constitutional interpretations for why Congress has the right to regulate this. And he also quotes at length um, Jefferson's famous lines from the Declaration of Independence about all men being created equal. So here's a founder um, late in life who's been kind of out of the public eye for some time, lending his prestige to the notion uh, that almost splits the nation apart then and there of preventing Missouri's entrance as a slave state that you know, precipitates the uh, Missouri crisis, which makes John Jay a very different figure from his former colleague, Thomas Jefferson, who during the Missouri crisis basically says, who are these radical sons who will tear apart the country that their, their fathers built? He's not thinking of the Jays specifically, but he might as well be because John Jay's 
son, Peter S.J., is a leader in New York of the opposition to the admission of Missouri. He is one of those radical sons, and he pulls his father late in life along with him to oppose the admission of Missouri, while uh, Thomas Jefferson is decrying this as a horrible radical act that's threatening to destroy the country. Um, so uh, Peter Augustus Jay um, moves on to other philanthropic causes, but his position um, as the torchbearer of the family's anti-slavery tradition is more than adequately carried on uh, by John Jay's second son, William Jay, and his grandson and namesake, John Jay II. Uh, you know, time's not gonna permit me to go into um, their full careers, um, but it's worth noting, uh, to go back to the Supreme Court theme, that um, w William Jay, who was just writes a torn of some of the best anti-slavery writings of, of, the, of the antebellum era, books, pamphlets that are just insightful, uh, inspiring, uh, and uncompromising their denunciation of slavery, uh, John Jay, uh, William Jay plays a sort of unsung role in the famous Amistad case. Um, in fact, uh, so the Amistad case, which some of you may know from the famous uh, Steven Spielberg movie, um, the case of Africans who were legally uh, imported to Cuba and then off the coast of Cuba seize the ship from their captors, and that ship eventually makes it uh, uh, up to Long Island Sound, uh, where it's seized by uh, the U.S. Navy, and therein uh, precipitates a series of, of, of incredibly intense um, trials that ultimately make their way all the way to the Supreme Court, uh, where John Quincy Adams famously represents the Amistad Africans successfully uh, in gaining their freedom. But what is le far less known is that William J. may be part of the reason John Quincy Adams got involved at all. It's in fact, John Quincy Adams read a letter that William J. wrote to the Emancipator early uh, after the um, Amistad Africans um, arrived uh, on these shores, analyzing it. Um, and John Quincy Adams writes uh, William J. that the Africans have vindicated their own right to liberty by executing the justice of heaven. Um, and John Quincy Adams explicitly drew on William's investigative work in some of his remarks before Congress to put the Van Buren administration on notice that they're being watched very carefully um, in their efforts to try to um, essentially get the Amistad Africans back to Cuba and to certain death as fast as possible. And John Quincy Adams um, is using some of Jay's research in his public remarks. Uh, and also John Jay's got the ear of Lewis Tappan, the very famous uh, uh, and very wealthy New York abolitionist who sort of mobilized his resources for the Amistad Africans defense. Um, and uh, also channel some of John Jay's legal advice to the legal team uh, and so William J. Uh, stick with our Supreme Court uh, theme, you know, plays that sort of important and unsung role. I, I also want to say, as I kind of bring uh, my remark, four more remarks to the close and uh, we get to um, your questions, uh, that uh, this sort of Supreme Court legacy is very much something that was on William J.'s mind all the way to his death. Uh, because shortly before his death, the most in, one of the most infamous Supreme Court decisions of all, the Dred Scott decision, uh, handed down by Justice Taney here, uh, here's Dred Scott, um, absolutely disgusted um, William J., who felt that, uh, that Taney had completely distorted history in order to make the ruling that African Americans were never citizens and never intended to be citizens and therefore had no standing to sue in court, in addition to obliterating um, the, the law that prevented um, slaveholders from bringing enslaved people into the Northwest Territories by which the Continental Congress had enacted. Um, that you know, the Taney decision just disgusted William J. who he accused, uh, he accused Taney of audacious mendacity and in a, in a lengthy document he generated for the legal theorist Francis Lieber who would go on to be um, basically the, the Lieber code was the Lincoln's code for uh, military conduct of the Civil War, so a very important person. Um, he goes through all the ways in which uh, the founders, including John Jay, were anti-slavery. They were presidents of anti-slavery organizations. He quotes from uh, his father's famous anti-Missouri letter, uh, which itself quoted the Declaration of Independence. Uh, and John and William Jay in his letter underscores and puts in all caps, all men are created equal. And so he thinks of this as sort of like the America can't have just as Tawny's legacy and John Jay's legacy. Uh, so it's no wonder that William Jay um, was lauded in Frederick Douglass's brilliant eulogy to William Jay in 18, uh, 1859, 
Frederick Douglass declared, in the great cause of universal freedom, his name was a tower of strength and his pen a two-edged sword. Um, I, I, I had stuff to say about um, John Jay II, but I really want to make sure we get to uh, your questions. But um, his legal career is also fascinating in the ways that he used his uh, legal training um, to advocate for um, the cause of enslaved people um, and uh, for racial justice uh, and carried that reputation forward. But looking at the clock, I, I really want to make sure we have time for some questions. So we're going to not give John Jay II his due um, and just say that he is part of this legal legacy that I hope I've outlined for you uh, today. Okay, great. Thank you, David. That was really interesting. Um, there's so much information covered here and even that we couldn't get to. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to Mary, who has been monitoring the chat, and we'll still be looking at the chat. So if you have any questions, feel free to submit them now. Yeah, keep letting, uh, can you hear me? I put my microphone in. No? You're a little low, but I can hear you. I can hear you. The joys of Zoom, everybody. <laughs> okay, much better. I hope everybody can hear me now. We had a bunch of great questions come in. I'm gonna go in with the Q&A function first. Um, Robert asked, to live with the paradox of owning slaves but being a member of the Manumission Society, did Jay treat his slaves better, uh, paid them better, freed them upon his death, no physical punishment, et cetera? So that's a great question. Um, to the, the issue of what kind of, slaveholder was John Jay. Um, I mean, I want to start by the premise that like slavery, North, South, um, where, you know, is an institution of coercion and the slaveholder holds all the power in these relationships. And so when we look at what kind of slaveholder John Jay was, it's worth just basing the premise on the fact that um, he gets to decide when he is magnanimous and to whom he's magnanimous and when he wants to be uh, vindictive. So what I sort of detect as a, uh, in my sort of study of, of John Jay as a slaveholder is it's a spectrum from sort of cruelty to callousness to caring. Um, and he gets to decide when he wants to be sort of casually cruel, when he wants to be just sort of callous and indifferent, and when he uh, wants to um, show um, uh, magnanimity. Uh, so I can give you some, you know, examples. Um, well, some of you may have read Martha Jones's piece in the New York Times about six months ago, which is something I also cover uh, from my own angle in my book uh, about the slave Abby or Abigail uh, in Paris, um, who is with the family, uh, probably not legally in, in France, given France, French slave laws at the time, but nonetheless with the family in France at the time of the negotiation of peace of Paris. And, um, uh, and I apologize if you know all the fact, if you remember the New York Times article, but anyway, so Abigail, um, she falls out with Sarah Jay while John Jay's out of town and with one of the French servants who's very cruel to mean to her uh, and runs away and takes wage work with a local laundress. And Sarah Jay, uh, asks Benjamin Franklin, what should we do? And Benjamin Franklin says, I got connections. Uh, let's teach her a lesson. Let's throw her in prison, teach, you know, show her, you know, who's boss and what's, uh, you know, who's in charge here. Uh, and Abby um, gets probably pneumonia. Um, they bring her back to the house, but she dies. Um, now, I know that's not John Jay, but that's Sarah, his wife. But John Jay um, is puzzled in his letters, uh, he's puzzled. He said, I don't understand why she did this. You know, I told her I'd free her when we got back to the United States. Well, who knows whether he did or he didn't, but he says he did. So, but nonetheless, he, he can't understand why she would, this act of sort of self-assertion, like what could have motivated it, why she just didn't wait, why she didn't trust us. And he's far more, but he's far more concerned with his wife's emotional state, having experienced this trauma of having her, you know, bondswoman die than he is about, um, Abby's death. I mean, he's not indifferent to it, but his real concern is if you know, Sarah is shaken by this. Um, meanwhile, the servants, including a, a, a man named uh, Benoit, who they purchased in Martinique on their way to France, and, and some of the French servants think the house is haunted. And I think that, that the haunting is a way of saying there's unresolved, in, there's something unresolved here, there's something not right here. Like, we don't have, you don't have to believe in ghosts to understand what they're communicating that the white jays can't quite grasp, which is something they they think it's 
funny, silly that they think the house is haunted. But uh, the servants are saying something wrong happened here. Um, and so that's that's like a particularly poignant example. Um, you know, there's this uh, enslaved person uh, who's with the governor's household when he's governor in Albany, uh, Caesar, who's a real troublemaker. Um, and so and it's embarrassing. And he's like, well, I would be not be good if I was, I shouldn't be seen physically correcting him. You know, he doesn't say it's wrong or, but he doesn't, but he said, I don't want to be, you know, seen physically correcting him, you know, I'm the governor, you know, this is for whatever reason. So he sends uh, Caesar down to uh, New York City where his son, uh, Peter Augustus is a young lawyer and says, you know, uh, do what you want. And if he's a problem, get rid of him. Um, he ends up, Caesar ends up running away, winding up, it's a crazy story, winding up in, in San Domingue in Haiti during the Re Haitian Revolution, um, gets word through an American diplomat that he's miserable. And John Jay says, all right, well, we should probably bring him back. And it's hard to be positive, but we think, people in the sort of Jay world think that this is the same man, Caesar Valentine, who goes on to uh, be a servant in, the, in Peter Augustus Jay's household as a free person into the 1840s and has remembered in Peter Augustus Jay's will, as many of, as is quite often the case where for the, so the, the, the people who they feel were loyal, it's, there's this tradition in your will to leave money, to leave an annuity. Um, so, uh, and you know, so William J. leaves Zilpa Montgomery uh, an annuity, uh, and Peter Augustus J. leaves Caesar Valentine an annuity. And William J. also says, just to show you this image, that uh, when Zilpa dies, she should be buried in the J. family plot. And in fact, she is buried in the J. family plot. She dies in 1872, and to this day, you can go to St. Matthew's Church. Uh, and see this uh, this tombstone. Um, so the Jays control the cruelty, kindness, loyalty equation, um, and I think that's important to keep in mind. But I I, I don't want to talk so long that we don't get to another question. <laughs> um, I saw a couple of questions come in about the enslaved household members. So I saw a question about do you know their names? Um, oh, yeah. Somebody asked, do you know if the five African Americans in the Jay household were related? Were they Pete's family? Do you know what became of them? So I think people want to know what happened oh. a little bit later on and how that still reacts with the John Jay house. Great, great question. So some of them are really like uh, most famously, like Zilpa is undoubtedly uh, Clorinda. It's uh, uh, daughter. We think that there's a previous generation Zilpa that is either Clorinda's mother or she's sort of essentially fictive kin. But, you know, so there's a naming pattern that we can trace there, a Zilpa to a Clorinda to a Zilpa. Um, so that's a mother and daughter. Um, you know, I, it's interesting what became of uh, Pete. I, there's a names repeat a lot, both on the African American side of the family uh, or the household, not family, the household and the Jay family. I mean, there is a Pete who winds up on it. It could could be I can't prove it. Could be the same Pete that um, John Jay brought with him to England. Winds up in John Jay has a brother who's blind and is often known as Blind Peter because there's so many people named Peter in the Jay family that he's always known as Blind Peter. And Pete and um, Caesar, who I already mentioned, um, kind of get restive and, and Uncle Peter, Blind Peter Jay, um, thinks that he you know, has more control over the situation. This is in the, in the, in the I think, the 18 teens. Um, and, um, John Jay goes down there and Peter Augustus Jay go down there and they're like, look, you can't treat, this is not the middle of the 18th century. You can't treat them this way. And you're an old blind man and you've got to accommodate them. And you might want to think about more, you know, carrots here. You might think about accommodating their wishes. Um, and blind Peter's widow, Breeze, I'm trying to make sure I remember the sequence. Um, ultimately, both Caesar and Pete could be the same. Pete could be a different one. Uh, ultimately get their freedom of, under the ages of Blind Peter's widow. Um, and then we, if it's the same Caesar all the way through, which it quite likely is, he winds up as a servant. Uh, Peter Augustus J inherits his uncle's property um, and, uh, and Caesar uh, works for him um, for many years, although I cannot find him in the census. 
Uh, so, I, you know, so it's hard to know whether he at some point departs service, but he, he receives an annuity from Peter Augustus J. So that's that's another one that we can trace. When uh, Pete becomes a free person, he changes his name to Peter Johnson. Interestingly, like which has all kinds of potential meanings. Why Johnson? You know, is that a reference to, to John Jay? Uh, but note that he eliminates the sort of diminutive, diminutive of Pete and, and becomes a, a you know Peter. So um, lots of things to interpret there. Um, you know, others um, are uh, well. There's a really sad story about a woman named Dinah, who was briefly in John Jay's household in the 1790s, and later uh, comes back to Peter Augustus Jay and, and says, you know, when 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 we left the household, my son and I. Uh, we were supposed to get our freedom. I'm free, but my son is is being held as a slave. Um, you know, basically, can you help us? And John Day writes a pretty callous note saying, I don't remember making any promises. So that's an example of like, well, Dinah was there a few years, but was not, didn't become one of the favored people. And so when his own son, who's now an officer in the, and a lawyer for the uh, Manumission Society, who, who does all this work on behalf of people who, who are being abused or who are being held as slaves who shouldn't be, um, he writes his own son and says, I, you know, I, I, I don't remember making the promise, so basically I can't help you. And meanwhile, this poor woman's son is being held in bondage. Um, so, you know, they, again, this is that spectrum from, from callousness to kindness uh, with behaviors in between. Um, Mind history is always very yes. messy. Yes, and with slavery, I mean, it's important to keep in mind that, um, Yes, Northern slavery is different from Southern slavery. And yes, the Jays, uh, particularly John Jay, have a, take a different path than people like Thomas Jefferson. Um, it, is, it is always a story about inequality um, and of, of asymmetries of power that have real life consequences um, for real life people. Um, and, I, and that's as important as the political story that I also told and that I focused on in my uh, formal remarks. Absolutely. Uh, that's a great lead into a question we got from Barb. What were the legal constraints, if any, for slaveholders to free their slaves circa 1790? That's also a great question. So this becomes a much contested um, issue in New York is uh, there's a lot of concern about um, whether enslaved people when they reach a certain age will essentially be dumped on the public roles at a time when there are basically where, where um, the notion of welfare institutions are incredibly, uh, and, and the infrastructure is basically non-existent. So this becomes a real issue. And, um, you know, that, that, that there's sort of a back and forth about how much leeway um, uh, people who own slaves should have in freeing people um, if they can't um, be supported if they're gonna become a sort of public charge. In the 1799 law, um, it's pretty liberal uh, in the sense of leaving it in, uh, in the hands of um, the enslaver to sort of decide. Uh, there are subsequent laws that um, put more um, constraints. Um, so this is definitely an issue that uh, is, is politically complicated. It's like, how, I don't know, um, is, is freedom going to create a sort of, uh, public burden, and that's definitely something that is very much on the mind of, of legislators. Um, so that's a really good question. Uh, our last question as we round up tonight uh, is a nicer one. It's an easier one than the heavy topic that we've been talking about. If you could dine at Francis Tavern with anybody, who would you dine with and why? All right, so I'm gonna, you know, you know I'm gonna make a biographer's confession <laughs> um, which is, I, I don't know if this answers the, the Francis Tavern question specifically, but I do have a favorite member of the Jay family and it's definitely William Jay. Um, uh, to me, um, he is, uh, um, his commitment, his, uh, his willingness to change in midlife, to, you know, he's, he's an established county judge, a wealthy man, um, you know, he's, uh, you know, in, into his 40s when he sort of embraces the cause of immediate emancipation and then stays with it to his death, um, you know, in a really symbolically important act, um, 
deeds $1,000 to his son, John Jay II, to support John Jay II's work on behalf of fugitives. Um, that's exactly the same amount that you can get fined for not uh, for defying demands of federal marshals to help uh, in the rendition of runaway slaves. So, you know, even in his death, and this is part of the reason Frederick Douglass celebrated, even in his death, he is still making a, a mark uh, on behalf of justice. Um, you know, he, he's cerebral, he's lawyer-like, um, he, you know, uh, he and his son are both involved in underground railroad activities, but unlike um, John Jay II's ego and ambition, um, makes him less of an appealing figure, whereas uh, William J, um, it's really not about the fame and it's really not about uh, office holding, it really is about the cause and um, and finding a way, you know, if I can sort of bring this all back together, you know, the major theme of the book is both the way that values are transferred or conveyed and the way they're transformed. And so for William J, he will say, to, you know, that he imbibed his anti-slavery principles from his father, but he is not, his, his father's kind of abolitionist, right? He's, he, he takes that spirit of freedom and does something new and powerful um, uh, and sort of intellectually supercharged um, and also moves. And he, you know, he's much more, he, he becomes more racially egalitarian with time. In other words, he, he shows growth into his, and I'm, I'm in my mid fifties, so I don't know how much growth keeps happening, moral growth keeps happening for us, but he keeps morally growing throughout his, his life. And uh, so if I could sit down now, they're real temperance types. So I don't know if I was at France's Tavern, whether what we'd be drinking, um, <laughs> But that's the that's the J that I would like to uh, to take to Francis Tavern. You don't have to have a beer. Don't worry. Okay. I, I will have a, I will have a beer. I don't know. If we'll, I don't know what William will be drinking. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, David, for um, this wonderful presentation and your wonderful answer to all these questions. Thank you, Mary, for moderating our Q and A, and thank you to all of you at home for joining us. If you want to learn more, you can check out David's book, Liberty's Chain. Um, and you can read all about uh, the Jay family there. If you enjoyed tonight's lecture and would like to stay up to date with all of our programs, you can join our mailing list by going to the museum's website, francistavernmuseum.org. There you will also find all of our social media accounts as well as a calendar of upcoming programs. We have not yet updated for the next quarter for the rest of the year, but that will be coming soon. So stay tuned for our next lecture and some really fun events in September. Thank you to those of you who have donated to the museum. Your generous support helps us fulfill our mission and share the history of the American Revolutionary Era with the public. If you would like to make a donation, you can also do that on our website. Again, that's francestavernmuseum.org. And if you are in the New York City area, drop by and see us. Check out the museum. We are open Wednesday through Sunday. So thank you again for joining us for another Francis Tavern Museum evening lecture, and we hope to see you again soon, either virtually or in person. <laughs> <laughs>